a couple things before we get started. Cell phones, quiet. There's going to be a lot of people here, obviously, and a lot of people are going to have things to say. There's going to be a presentation, so if you pay attention to that, maybe a lot of your questions will be answered before you ever have to ask them. If you do have a bunch of questions, prioritize them, because if you come up with three, four questions, we're going to shut you off for a number of people. These gentlemen, these ladies, have traveled quite a distance. They want to get home tonight. So do I. So uh, we're not going to have long speeches or anything. One person will have the floor. Whoever has the floor can speak. We don't want to have a lot of other people button in on it. Oh, let's see. If you have a group, one person should be the speaker for your group. I'm going to introduce Matt Beck, who is the PennDOT, I guess he's project manager now. Assistant plans engineer for District 3. Okay, his boss decided to take the turn in the game, so he's a, hot, he's a hot show now. So uh, Matt will introduce you to everybody else, and he's going to present the, make the presentation, and he's going to take over the meeting from here on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dean, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, like Dean said, my name is Matt Beck. I'm the assistant plans engineer for PennDOT District 3. Uh, I'd like to just go around and introduce the other members of our design team for the CSVT project that are here. Uh, starting with PennDOT folks, we have our assistant district executive for design, TJ Cunningham. Uh, we have a civil engineer working on the project, Jeff Kerr. Uh, an assistant construction engineer, Ted Deptula, here in the back. Uh, then from our final design consultant team, first from Gannett Fleming, we have Brian Stevenson and Steve Rizicki in the back. Uh, from McCormick Taylor, we have Chris Banner. And from our environmental consultant team, Skelly and Loy, uh, we have Sandy Bayshore back in the corner and Bill Coffell over in the other corner. Uh, so again, thanks for having us, first of all. It's great to get a, a good turnout uh, to be able to give you an update on some of the design work that we've done over the last year and to get some input on some, some key items. Uh, just to take a, a quick step back to get everybody on the same page on how we got to where we are. Uh, the proposed alignment for the CSVT project was established about a decade ago uh, through the environmental impact statement process. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there were funding limitations over the years that ultimately prevented us from starting final design of what we call the southern section until about a year ago. Uh, I'd like to emphasize now, and you might hear me do it again later, that we are still in the early stages of final design. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, just engineering work, uh, and other pre-construction work like acquiring right-of-way, moving utilities, uh, before we can ultimately start construction in about three years. Uh, so our first year of final design work focused on things like soil investigations, field surveys, utility coordination, uh, preliminary roadway and bridge designs, and specifically it, it included in our analyses of the items that we're here to talk about tonight. Those items fall into two main categories, uh, value engineering recommendations and design refinements. And to talk about that first category a little bit more, value engineering recommendations, one of the things that we're required to do and that we just do as a best practice on, on projects of this scale is to have a value engineering review completed. And what that means is that we bring an, an independent team in to look at the project uh, and for them to review it and ultimately use creative thinking uh, to come up with ways to accomplish the project's original purpose at the lowest life cycle cost and without sacrificing safety, quality, or the environment. Uh, the value engineering review that we had done for the southern section of CSVT uh, came up with two specific recommendations that we wanted to get input on. Uh, it specifically, it recommended that we study the possibility of cutting off two local roads uh, that would otherwise need the overpass bridges installed as part of the project. Mr. Beck, may we interject questions at this time or hold no. early? Okay. I may touch on what your, what your question is. Okay. Um, 
And we understand, and I'll, I'll emphasize this and you'll, you'll hear it again later, we understand that uh, the design of this project for years has included uh, bridges to either carry the new highway over local roads or carry local roads over the new highway. Uh, so we understand that changing that now is a, a significant change in thinking uh, related to the project. But at the same time, there would be pot potential significant cost savings associated with eliminating these bridges. And to do our, our best job in being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, uh, we think they at least warrant investigation. So uh, we had brought these two bridges up that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Uh, we had brought them up to the township supervisors recently looking for input. Uh, and they had ultimately scheduled this meeting for that purpose here tonight. The other uh, set of items that we're going to look at in detail tonight are what we're calling design refinements. Uh, and those include changes that we've made to the proposed local road configurations throughout the southern section. And we've identified them as being needed to accomplish the goals of improving safety, improving traffic flow, uh, minimizing impacts to various resources, addressing concerns with constructing the project, and or reducing costs. Uh, and these are ultimately the configurations that we plan to move forward through final design, right-of-way plan preparation, and the permitting stages of the project. Uh, again, though, I'll emphasize that we are still in the early stages of design. So these configurations that you'll see, uh, while the, the concept shouldn't change moving forward, uh, the plans definitely are still preliminary at this point, and we have a lot of details to work out related to things like drainage or stormwater management design or access for construction equipment. So at this point, to start to get us into these items, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Stevenson from Gannett Fleming, uh, who's first going to orient everybody to the southern section of the project. Thanks, Matt. Um, as Matt said, just going to take you through a quick uh, project overview. Uh, to get you oriented here, down here we have the 522 interchange with 1115. We have the Golden Strip here, and down here is the uh, interchange with 1115 and 61. So our project starts down here at the southern limit at the 522 interchange, heads up in a northern direction, past the Penn Valley Airport, past Airport Road, Mill Road, crosses over Attic, and then starts a curve off to the, uh, in the eastern direction. Uh, there we'll head down towards the Colonial Acres area, crossing over Park and Fisher, continue on east, and just past the 11th Street crossing, we'll have our roadway turn back to the north and head up to the northern end of the project where we tie into the northern section. Down here we have the uh, 61 connector. It will begin down at the 61 interchange with 1115, <laughs> head up in the northwest direction, and tie in with the CSVT interchange. So, <clears throat> heading into talk a little bit more about the uh, value engineering recommendations. As Matt noted, right now we're just in the study phase. Um, PennDOT recognizes these bridges have been part of the design since the very early stages. And if there's any reasonable objection to the bridges, PennDOT will construct the bridges. If there are no reasonable objections right now, we're just looking to whoops, further study the eliminate, eliminating the bridges. So what happens if we do take the bridges out? What impacts are they? Well, first we would have crossing roads would be cut off. Because they're cut off, we would have cul-de-sacs on each side of CSVT, and obviously the traffic patterns would be revised. The big benefit to all this is the significant cost savings to the project. So let's take a look at these two locations that we've been talking about. First one here is Attic Road. CSVT currently crosses Attic Road approximately a tenth of a mile in from Penn's Drive Creek. If the bridge were to be removed, we would have to alter track. We would have a cul-de-sac here and a cul-de-sac here on each side. Um, anyone that would be wanting to 
for being on this side of Attic Road and want to head over <coughs> towards App Road, would have to come down Penn's Drive, Mill, back up App, and you'd end up back at the same point. Approximately <coughs> just shy of two miles, about three minutes travel time. Conversely, if you're east of the cutoff, <coughs> you'd head down Attic, come back the opposite direction, a little over two miles, about four minutes. How long will walk with that thing? <laughs> walk, I'm not sure. I'm not joking. No, I know you're not joking. I don't know what the time is. So, um, overall, the project savings with eliminating that bridge and the future maintenance costs would be about $3.2 million. Next, we'll look at Grangers. Grangers Road, CSBT is crossing Grangers Road about three tenths of a mile in from the 15, or the intersection with 15. To the west of CSBT, the alternate route would be over to Park Road, up the County Line Road, back out to 15. Now, I do believe there's a no left, top, no left turn sign here, so all traffic would be forced to make the right on the 15, come down to this intersection, and here you'd be able to continue south on 15, or take the turn and head back north 15 northbound. Well, I, I think at this point, if it's okay with the supervisor, we'll open it up for input on these issues. Okay, can I ask a question? If anybody has a question, you have them give their names first so she can get the answers. Sure. So, that, so I guess at this time we'll open up to some questions or comments on the uh, bridge, bridge removal study. And again, we're looking for input of, of things that if we're going to pursue these further, that we want to take those concerns into account. Uh, you know, again, we're, we understand that Eliminating the bridges would cause some additional travel distance and time, and there's some uh, personal inconvenience associated with that, but we're looking for you know, big picture issues, again, trying to make best use of, of taxpayer dollars. So we'll open it up now. Like Dean said, if you could identify yourself before you ask a question, we'd appreciate it. I'm Bob Dapp, President of the Homeowners Association for Colonial Drive. The Monies have been approved for this project the way they sit without changing, making all these changes and closing these roads, number one. Number two, the inconvenience to all the residents by closing these roads that are supposed to be open. Number three, they did impact studies, sound uh, checks on our road for the impact of the bridges. Now you lower the road down to our level, we're going to have a lot more noise concerns. What are you going to do about it? I don't believe we're changing the uh, grade of the road. The, the bridges would still be at the same profile that they were at, at the end of preliminary design. There. You're saying the roadway surface would be exactly where the bridge deck had been yeah, planned. That area would basically be filled in with a large quantity of... And what about noise restrictions for our, for our development up here? We're going to have all that noise. I believe we have noise studies planned to uh, look into that. I, uh, I'm against it. I think it's ridiculous. The money's already been approved the way it is. Your inconvenience of all the citizens here is ridiculous. It's not just the inconvenience. We have a house up there that has people that are, are mentally and, and disabled, disabled up there. We're worried about the time it's going to take fire equipment to get to our residents up there. You may be eliminating the, the system that we have for water up there because that's right down there where the path of the road is going to be. So we haven't heard any concerns about that. Plus, we were also told at a meeting quite some time ago that there would be no roads closed. That was what you folks told us. Understood. Yeah, I'm Bob Gaitel. I live on uh, Penn's Drive. And according to your proposal, you're going to lower that bridge going over Attic. Am I correct? Or, or just fill it in so the road is going to be lower than originally proposed. Am I no, correct? The Same road level? is not lower. <laughs> right. So is there, and is, is there any noise abatement 
uh, planning for anywhere along this road in, in your overall plans that you're saving this great ten million dollars out of six hundred and seventy million somehow I, I lose the, the I lose the concept of significance. That would all probably depend on the results of the noise study. Okay, I saw a bunch of them go. What is here. the noise study? Is that this noise studies are ongoing right now? Yeah, I believe they're starting here this summer. But it but it may be uh, six months to a year before we have final results on that. Okay, I saw another one over here. A uh, couple points. So um, since you have such a name, no, I'm sorry, Daniel Garrett, Winfield. Um, mm -hmm. To be good stewards of the taxpayers' money, as you said, um, have you considered refunding some of the tax money back to us for our inconvenience? I think it would be much easier to sell you that into the equation right now. Excuse me, we pull it down so we can hear everybody. My name is Christine Grace. I live on Adding Road, and I'm trying to picture if uh, if this proposed change is made. So uh, I live on along the purple part of Adding Road, and on the left hand side you would have a cul-de-sac. But then you're talking about the road not being lowered. So am I correct? I if I went down that way in Attic Road, there'd be a cul-de-sac and then a huge mound of earth and a road you on have top. Yeah. Filling up to the road. Yeah. Yeah. How wide is it now? Yeah, minimum clearance is at least sixteen six. What? What's the with with if there was a bridge there, the minimum clearance would be at least 16 and a half feet. So I was seven or eight feet for a bridge. Yeah, yeah. so you're 25 feet or something. Yeah, at least 25 feet. I'm not 100% sure what the number is, though. I don't have the profile. So when we drove down and we were in that cul de sac, what would we be looking at? The stone wall? Like, or just a huge retaining wall? It wouldn't be a retaining wall, it would be a person thing. We have quiet in conjunction to both those names. Names, sir. Sorry. Name. Name. Name's Name Paul Blue. I live on 11th Avenue. In relation to both those roads being closed, has any thoughts been given to response time of emergency vehicles? <laughs> We do want to factor that in. How are you going to factor that in if you close the road? I think we need that input from the emergency response. Yeah, that's exactly the type of input we're looking for. How how do changes like this impact emergency response? Before the night's over, you'll get it. <laughs> okay, I don't know who was first. Uh, okay. Yeah. Steve Capera. I live on Mark Drive in Winfield. Um, <clears throat> Prior to the meeting, I pointed out where my house was, and I couldn't even get a straight answer whether or not the road was going to be elevated behind it. How exactly are you doing a noise study effectively on a road that hasn't even been built, and you're not even, can't even give me a straight answer whether it's off the ground or not? Well, I'm, I'm not in noise study. I'm not sure how they approach that. Um, I'm sure they have the various road elevations factored in. We have the grades in alignment of the road. Like Matt had pointed out, we have the horizontal alignment, how it goes if you're looking down the map. We also have the vertical alignment, how it goes if you're driving up and down. We have other information. If somebody can't help you now, we can get back to you, but we should know what the elevation of the roadway is at that location. We know that the, ele the roadway elevation is about location of the road. I'm Marsha Eichner. I live on Park Road. I, I use Granger's Road about one time or more a day. I have a, a disabled husband. We go to Geisinger a lot. It's much easier to go down Granger and go across the hill. It would be a shame that we'd have to go all the way down to County Line to get across. It would really be an inconvenience. And I know you don't want to hear inconvenience. That's what the paper said. But I think I'm still going to put my name in there that it's an inconvenience. It's nice the way it is. And the road is always kept very clear, even in the winter. Sunbury Road, forget it. 
Yeah, you're here. Yeah. Back. Dennis Marquette, I apologize for speaking up earlier. Uh, but my concerns are uh, your Department of Transportation, and it seems like you're only concerned with motorized transportation, not concerning bikes or walkers. Uh, again, that's uh, what, three mile detour, whatever it is there. But uh, these people live on Attic Road, access to the creek. Can't walk, can't ride down there, it's no access at all. Uh, your detour for Great Hollow and the no left turn is ridiculous. There's no way you can look at that and say that makes any sense at all. So, I think the Department of Transportation should consider all users. You guys are revising County Line Road intersection. Is that left turn? It's <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter Dekbell. My, my question is, and I know this isn't up for discussion, is the dual roundabouts on Mill Road. We're, we're going to get yeah, into those in more detail. But my question okay. is, you talked about the detour. On, I live on Penn's Drive. So the detour coming off when you cut Attic off, I run that. I run Attic three, four times a day. And I know you're studying what I read in the paper or read in WKOK. Okay, so it's something about 278 was what you saw the average traffic study was number of vehicles that run down attic every day. Um, I, I, I've seen a number of people that run, ride. Did your study include any of those activities as part, as part of your closure or not? And secondly, with those roundabouts, the additional traffic of 278 vehicles coming out of Penn's Drive on the mill, has that even been factored into your decision to cut off? Attic, because there's a ton of people that go down Attic every day and then pick up app there because trying to come out and make a left-hand turn during traffic in the morning, during school times, forget it, and the school buses. And school buses alone, it, 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 it's, it's a congestion point even at that intersection. Now you're dumping another 278 people off of that intersection just to pick up. $3.2 million. It doesn't make sense. Because it's come up a couple of times, our our traffic counts did obviously just uh, count the number of motorized vehicles. You know, again, we're here tonight to hear concerns about the impacts to pedestrian and, and bicyclists. And it's, and it's safer for the pedestrians on Attic than it is to come out to mill or to come on to Attic. Yeah. We'll certainly talk about how much traffic can flow through those roundabouts a little bit. Okay. Uh, Ryan Mack, I live down below Grand Journal 15. Well, one thing that I want to bring up is when you take a lot of that traffic and you move it down to the crossovers, those crossovers aren't very deep. And 5 o'clock in the evening, they're backed up with cars now with Granger being open. So if you take that out and you take everything down to the other crossovers, I see that backing up and coming out on 15. We can take that in. I mean, and look at it. other people have also said school buses, school buses travel those roads, and, and so on. Okay. Yeah, Robert Straub, and uh, if you'll switch frames back to the um, Grangers. Yeah, so, uh, what was the count, the daily count on Grangers? Uh, 738. Okay, and how about County Line Road that you're in? Uh, Steve, you had that? Five. Yeah, that was about five. Five to six hundred vehicles a day. Yeah. Our, home, our home was right here for the last 40 some years. Okay. And uh, our point of view is closing Granger Road is going to make a mess, a worse mess than it is now. Because Park Road right now and county line of course granger whatever very narrow uh, shoulders on the thing and for somebody to jog bicycling uh, weeding their property or what have you it's very very dangerous uh, we also have a lot of farm equipment coming there nine months out of the year because a lot of this is farm area and uh, they need their space too to keep on so it's not country anymore, and it's dangerous. It's dangerous for the people that are outside of the vehicle. It's dangerous for the farmers that are moving equipment on there. It's dangerous for us who are living there because with the increased traffic, you're going to have air pollution, you're going to have noise pollution, 
these areas mm -hmm. and uh, our, our pets, our young children, whatever, they make a mistake and head out there, it's, it's going to be much, much worse. So uh, just the idea of absorbing that traffic when Granger's Island or Granger's Road would be closed on the county line and in particular Park Road. Yeah, much, much more than Okay, on serious questions. Um, I have two small children, so my biggest concern about the whole thing is emergency response time. You said that that will be taken into consideration. Um, will the details of that be made public, and how, can you tell me how you plan on going about that? Because I don't expect that you do an analysis to every single house that's impacted. How, how, do you, how, does, how does that happen? I guess, could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, Daniel Gower, Mark, Mark Trotter. Okay, you might have before, but thanks again. In general, we, like you said, we don't look at an analysis of responses to every individual house. We generally rely on the input from emergency service providers. So, When would that take place and will it be public? Well, uh, like we said earlier, that's the type of input we're looking for tonight. I think from a representative of a local emergency service providers, he said we might get that input tonight. So. Oh, okay. With Marsha Eichner on Park Road, yes, yeah. but that corner at County Line Road is a nightmare. You're at the top of a hill. People pulling out there, you're going to have to take a right to go down where I go towards Hutt Sunbury. You can't see what's coming up that hill. It's a nightmare, and there's been terrific death accidents right on that intersection. In fact, the people on County Line on the other side cannot take a left. It's so bad. So that is a disaster just waiting to happen. You should leave Rangers the way it is. It's, you can see people coming down the hill. It's very safe. Well, I was going to say somewhat the same. I'm sorry, Suzanne Starr. I live on the top of Penn's Drive. The automatic was always coming out County Line Road onto the highway. But because of all the accidents, and I've had one, uh, we now go down through Granger's, and there's obviously a reason why there's 700 and some coming out at Granger's, and only 500 coming out at County Line Road. It's the danger at the County Line in Route 15, and that should be considered. I mean, that should be one of the most important. Do we need more information, please? Yeah. Yeah. The township's comfortable that you guys have input to be able to respond to us formally, right? Yeah, I have one question, but I can get to you later. <laughs> okay. Hello? About one, one more. You want to okay. okay, one more, and then we're going to move on to the design yeah. of My name's Mike Rhodes. I purchased a property on Attic Road a little over a year ago based on the, the design plans as originally designed, which I researched with the district office up in Montoursville. Um, if you're looking to save money, my feeling is why is the roadway going to go across Attic Road, the whole way over top of the shale pit that's behind my house, and the whole way up onto the next ridge and then around to come back here. The highway is completely missing this farm that sits down here. Completely missing it. And you're going to have to go over two waterways as designed when there's no reason why you can't shorten that radius up and still end up at the same point out here on Park Road where you're going to cross. And again, I bought my property based on the fact that there was supposed to be an underpass on Attic Road. And I'm not a walker, I'm not a biker, but that's heavily used by foot traffic and bicycle traffic. And I don't, I would really like to know how you're going to propose going over the waterways that can't be obstructed and how you plan to get through these two hollows in a, in a cost-efficient manner when that radius could be shortened up by 
a great deal. That, go ahead. Well, I guess to first talk about the waterway impacts, we understand that if we were going to pursue these bridge eliminations, those are something that we'd have to coordinate with the environmental agencies. I guess for the, the alignment of the project overall, there's not one thing that you can point to, I guess, that set the original alignment. Uh, you know, for folks that were in the area uh, about a decade ago, they might be familiar with the year's worth of study that we went through where we considered uh, natural resources like wetlands and streams and uh, community resources or socioeconomic resources like businesses and residents, uh, historic resources like archaeological sites and historic buildings. So all of those things were taken into account plus cost and plus how well the design could meet the project need to come up with the alignment we have. And, you know, where we're at now is, again, the final design, trying to, to fine tune those those details uh, along the whole length of the highway. And we are considered, or we are concerned about noise as well. Mm -hmm. So the, again, the original plan was for the road to be elevated to a certain point. And I hear what you're saying, but in reality, if we're gonna close Attic Road, you're gonna drop the elevation if you're trying to save money. There's a whole lot of places in the state of Pennsylvania where you guys can save some money besides closing our road. Okay, I, I think we need to move on to the other design refinements. We'll certainly stick around afterwards if there's more specific questions. Uh, we can take them related to the possible bridge elimination. So, Brian, do you want to move on to the final design refinements? Yeah. Um, as we started about the final design, we identified a few areas along the alignment and within the project that we wanted to take a closer look at um, due to various concerns. Um, the first one was down here at the 522 interchange. The next one was at the uh, Mill Road, Airport Road, App Road area, and then last, the uh, Colonial Acres area. Um, we're going to talk about each of these locations in a little more detail. Um, with each location, we'll show you what the original design or what the design looked like at the end of preliminary design. We'll tell you a little bit about why we wanted to look at those areas. We'll tell you what changes we've made. And we'll tell you what impacts, benefits there were to us making these changes. So before we get into each of the individual areas, each of the locations that we look at will have a map similar to what you see here on the right side of the screen. I want to give you a little idea or tell you what you're going to be seeing. Um, the green hatched areas are going to be for the uh, pavement removal. Yellow will be new proposed roadway. Orange, proposed shoulder. The purple will be work to an existing bridge. Red will be a new proposed bridge. We have our cut and fill lines, and then we have proposed new traffic signals. So at this time, I'm gonna turn things over to Chris Banner with McCormick Taylor. He'll talk to you a little bit about the 522 interchange and the Mill Road, App Road, Airport Road area. All right, what we're gonna to go to first is the Seals Grove Interchange, and that's what we find here. Uh, this is 522 <coughs> South to Seals Grove. Right here is the existing off-ramp that everyone takes today from 1115 northbound down to 1115. This is Sheets with the existing jug handle to give you an orientation. What, uh, what we see here is what was proposed in preliminary design, and essentially what was going to be done at the interchange was to complete the interchange. A lot of the ramps you can kind of see today that were as existing, uh, it's currently graded in, which was completing the on-ramp with some widening of the existing structure to from northbound 522 to northbound CSVT, and constructing the ramp from southbound 1115 to northbound CSVT, and then to complete the interchange, construct the southbound ramps with the construction of a traffic signal 
for both to go either northbound or southbound on 522. What do we, why do we need to evaluate this area? Well, after a project has been shelled for about 10 years, you have to make sure it still meets current design criteria. And also, we wanted to evaluate if there's any other alternative to see if we can improve any of lo uh, the local traffic operations. And the, mod the major modifications <coughs> that were done to the, from preliminary design to what we're proposing today is essentially improving the, uh, we're modifying the uh, ramp B to eliminate any structure widening or existing <coughs> structure. That's just a, with an alignment change. Uh, we also improved the radius for the existing uh, northbound on-ramp. I'll go back here. We improved, we improved the alignment for this existing ramp so we wouldn't have to widen the structure. We improved this radius to, to, so we, it would meet a higher design speed. And also, we are going to uh, in, in, Modify the existing off ramp ramp G. Let me see if this come up. This here is the ramp B alignment. Improve radius there. And we're going to improve uh, improve the geometry, improve both the radius for the uh, reverse curve that's there today, because there is a tendency for truck rollovers in this area. So we're going to take the opportunity to improve that to reduce those in, uh, through. Uh, reduce those instances. So what are the benefits of that? It eliminates proposed widening of the existing structure. It will comply with current design criteria and reduces the likelihood of truck rollovers. Uh, the impacts of the realignment of Ramp G is additional right of way impact. Uh, additional studies that we're still looking at is, uh, is around the ramp D signal. Uh, we're still looking at the signal, uh, how to optimize the signal operation with, in, in conjunction with Jefferson Avenue. And uh, I know it was previously mentioned that was, we were looking at the possible elimination of the airport road jug handle that has now since been removed. That once we have uh, we got more traffic data, the jug handle is going to remain. And this and to uh, also further Jefferson Avenue is we're still evaluating how it's going to operate with the signal. It's either going to be included with the signal operation or it's going to function as it does today as a right in right out and that will be accomplished by installation of a pork chop island so access will still be maintained on Jefferson Avenue. But those are the additional studies that we're still evaluating today. Questions about the 522 interchange? Yes. Uh, Robert Brayston. Uh, question I have, just a, a couple little things. One of the main projects here is to alleviate truck congestion on the highway and the economic development. Um, I, I have been investing in some very large properties for manufacturing, and so we move a lot of tractor trailers mm -hmm. through this area. Uh, so one of my questions is, how is this going to help with the tractor trailer movement from 522 and south into Sealands Grove, entering southbound onto uh, 11 and 15. Southbound from? Southbound from Sealands Grove, without going through downtown Sealands Grove, or from Route 522 southbound. Yeah, the, it, the, those, those movements are still going to operate today. I know with, this, with the construction of the CSVT, a lot of the truck traffic that you experience on 11, business 11 and 15 today will now utilize the highway. The truck traffic still has to go down to business 11 and 15. If they need to go from northbound 11 and 15 to Sealands Grove, they will still use the utilize the jug handle at sheets. That is going to remain for that turning. So if I'm in Sealands Grove coming northbound, let's say I just come off 522, come across the Green Bridge. Yep. How am I going southbound on this highway? Right here at the traffic signal, we are, the barrier will be removed because it has to allow for both the northbound and southbound movements from southbound CSVT. You'll also be at this traffic signal, you'll also be able to turn left, and we're building a spur ramp onto the existing loop ramp today to go southbound 1115. Or if you want to go northbound, 
we're constructing the exit, this ramp will be constructed to take trucks onto northbound CSVT. Okay. Um, okay, that makes sense. So I, I guess the only some input I would just like to say is just to make sure that we have lost a lot of business because of the truck access in and out of Sealand Grove and on Route 522. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw that out there. That it's very important to have the truck access. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on to design refinements at the airport mill road intersection. What you see on the board is, again, what was proposed in preliminary design back when this, prior to the project being placed on hold. Uh, the original design was to relocate Airport Road to a stop controlled intersection and with this main line running northbound here. This is the airport runway and this is Mill Road as it's currently aligned today with, the, uh, with two structures being proposed across it. Uh, what we needed to look at for the design refinements. One, we needed to look to see if we can improve the skew angle between Mill Road and the CSVT bridge. Just to give you, uh, the skew angle is essentially the angle between the road underneath the bridge with the main line alignment right now. And this, this would be about a 45 degree angle. The optimal angle that you can have is a 90 degree. It gives you the shortest, that's what we would like to achieve with structures because it gives you the smallest bridge possible. So that's what we're looking to do at this location. Also, we needed to look to see, uh, eliminate the impact of the aqua chlorine tank facilities. This is aqua facility right here. The existing realignment of Airport Road would require impacts to their chlorine tanks, which is what they use to treat the water in the area. We did not want to impact those chlorine tanks, so we also need to look at what we, else we could do with Airport Road at that intersection. And also, uh, what other alternatives could be proposed to improve the traffic operation at the Mill Road at Road intersection? Uh, so the changes that we proposed to make was we realigned Mill Road and we realigned Airport Road. And to accomplish that, we replaced the T intersections with dual roundabouts. As you can see here, the green represents the pavement that would be removed. It, uh, this gave us a, a, a radius improvement, avoided the impacts of the chlorine tanks with Airport Road to a roundabout on this side. We now have a 90 degree alignment between Mill Road and the CSVT alignment. The structure, we have smaller structures, and that also, uh, with making this a 90 degree, we improve the sight distance between these two, between these two roadways. So reduce the bridge size. These are the benefits and impacts. We improve site distance. It, it will accommodate future growth in the area. Roundabouts have increased capacity than a standard four-way intersection. And it also will improve the safety at the intersection. Currently, based on a five-year uh, crash study done at the intersection of Mill Road and Airport Road, the crash rate is currently three and a half times higher than the state average. Savings are probably annoying bucks, but uh, one of the impacts that this will have is roundabouts utilize lower travel speeds. So that is on Amp Road, lower travel. So why would we consider a roundabout? One, it's safer operations because roundabouts are designed to reduce speeds approaching the intersection. It also eliminates the left turning movement, which is your primary cause of accidents. That is, you, you, the only way to enter and exit a roundabout is with a right turn. So the potential for the right angle left turn and head-on collisions are eliminated. Uh, the National Cooperative Highway has shown that roundabouts in general reduces crashes by 35%, injury related injuries by 76%, and fatalities are reduced by 90%. That's across, that's uh, with roundabouts installed across the United States. How, how do you handle pedestrian traffic in a roundabout? You don't. We'll get that to run to bed, okay. <laughs> 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 yes, you know, 
I, I'm from outside Philadelphia, and I've been to New Jersey a number of times. And roundabouts are a disaster in New Jersey. If you don't know how to drive roundabouts. Those are roundabouts. Those are roundabouts. Those are roundabouts. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a big difference. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Could you give your name again, sir? It's Peter Gretel. So, in improves traffic operations, it accommodates all vehicle types, trucks, emergency vehicles, and farm equipment. And this is a general uh, view of a three-legged roundabout, which will be out there today. And to address your question, typically pedestrians are not encouraged. They are routed. They don't are not routed through a roundabout. They are provided crossings before they get there. And there's yield signs the, uh, that traffic must yield to these crosswalks at these locations. But again, the elimination of the bridge on Attic Road, you're now pushing the pedestrian and bicycle traffic out to App Road to come back down Mill, they're going to have to do something here. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. All right. And that's and that's something we'll take. Okay. Just, just. And what we have up here is a is our uh, our modeling software to give you an idea of how a traffic operation, a typical operation, would work for a roundabout. As you can see, to enter the roundabout is all done by a right turn. Vehicles within the roundabout have right away, so we have a yield before you can enter. It's a yield condition. Would you get in the roundabout? You never get out. I know you're probably thinking of like a vacation. Yeah, that, that, that was that was a traffic service. <laughs> Can we have everybody's attention, please? Yeah. Let me get to the, the, the main. The main benefits of the roundabout is one: you cannot once you're within the roundabout, the driver has right away. Second, the, the only way to enter and exit a roundabout is with a right turn, right turn maneuver. So, uh, and and third, these roundabouts are designed to not exceed a speed of 20 miles an hour. So traffic is moving slower, which increases your decision distance. With this alignment, these are about 500 feet apart, which also that is a slight distance that's equivalent to over 40 miles an hour, but we're also slowing traffic down, so you have significantly more sight distance. And by eliminating the left turn cross maneuver, which is more than half of your crashes and it's a mistake, that is virtually eliminated, so that's where you get the safety benefit. If you want to experience this type of design, this we have three roundabouts installed on Bella Vista Drive, just in Williamsport. And when they are installed, they have seen all the safety benefits from a roundabout. So you have the opportunity today to go up there and drive through it, get your input, and send it back to us. But that's just uh, 40 miles to the north, and they've had great results, and they have three consecutive three-legged roundabouts just inside Williamsport. Do we have, all right, let's start with the questions. I'll, I'll start in the back, work my way to the front. Uh, Vincent Soups, I actually live in Seals Grove, but I spent a lot of money in Monroe Township, so it's really Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> I ride a lot of vehicles that only have two wheels, and I'm thinking specifically the gentleman's bicycle question, but also to the motorcycles, which Mill Road is a pretty popular ride to ride on your motorcycle because it's a gentle sloping curve that allows you to go out Mill Road and up App Road easily without having to really lean your bike hard or slow down significantly. You're taking what is well less than a 90 degree slow sloping turn from Mill to App into a well more than 90 degree, I mean you're coming almost all the way back around on a motorcycle which is going to make you come to a near dead stop in that roundabout and you're going to have full size vehicles coming flying into there. You may say it slows people down. We live here and Mill Road is not slow. <laughs> and I don't really want to get hit while riding my bicycle because that would suck. But to be able to prevent it by just not putting in a traffic circle, we had these on military bases. We had people getting hit all the time on two-wheel vehicles because full-size vehicles come in at full speed and two-wheel vehicles come in at a much slower speed and get rear-ended. One of the designs with a roundabout is prior to entry is what encourages me to design reverse curves on either side. There's a re there'll be a reverse curve on this leg and this leg of Mill Road 
which encourages vehicles. It's a proven concept. It's called a traffic calming measure. By traffic calming, it slows down for entry. Plus, you cannot fly through the roundabout. They're designed to slow and to 20 miles an hour. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yes. the ones they had on military bases, they put a big mound of dirt in the middle. So that way people couldn't even just fly right through. But what you do, I mean, Marines were not the smartest. You had drunk Marines that would come flying into that roundabout going straight. And they would not either just launch over to the, the roundabout and land on whatever's on the other side. Or they're crashing headlong into a big pile of dirt, whatever was in front of them. I mean, either way you look at it, this is unsafe compared to what's there now. Well, I can't argue with statistics. And statistics have always shown across the country, and large, in large part around uh, Europe, is crash rates are, are reduced. The biggest one is fatalities are nearly almost eliminated due to the fact that your most dangerous movement at any signalized or unsignalized intersection is the left turn. And the left turn is what is, a, is eliminated completely with the installation of roundabouts. So with that in itself, the intersections will operate at a safer, and plus vehicles will no longer be doing 45, 50 miles an hour coming along this bend. And as you pointed out, this is a sharp turn. Vehicles sitting here trying to pull out have a hard time locating vehicles due to this horizontal radius. Rather now, we straighten this out and you have a longer, larger sight distance and we're slowing down vehicles at this intersection, <coughs> therefore, mm -hmm. in effect, improving the operation. You gonna get rid of the buildings that are blocking the view there? Because that's what makes it hard to view, not the, the angle of the road. We all live here, dude. The like, Mill Road is a fast road. It is what it is. And I, like, and I, and, and people aren't going to slow down. Prior to proposing that, I sat, and I know in the PMP gallery there is a significant slack <laughs> on App Road for vehicles trying to turn out onto Mill Road because of the PM traffic flow going from the Golden Strip taking the back way rather than going down 522. They like to use Mill Road because it gives the backwards access into Sealands Road. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, hey, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, Christina Coolidge, I I can't remember when you did your value engineering study on the timing that if you closed Attic Road and that would add two minutes or three minutes. Did that take into account the traffic circles? I couldn't remember if the value engineering time frame, additional time, added the circles. If they didn't, if I will say if they did not include the roundabouts, it would, it would increase that time right. because it slowed down. You would be adding at least a minute or two to that travel time to make, like, make the loop. Because yeah. like you wouldn't be able to go full it's speed like along Mill Road. Right. Oh. Wait, Wait, that I'm sorry, we'll get to you next. Go ahead. Okay. Dennis Marquette. Uh, I would say that I'm in favor of the traffic circles. I don't know about your final design, but in general, I agree. It slows down traffic. Nobody likes stop signs because people don't follow them. Uh, it slows down traffic and makes them flow a lot better in my experience, so I think that's, in general, a good idea. Suzanne Starr, I'm on Penn's Drive, I'm on the northern end of Penn's Drive. One of my concerns that somebody else had also brought up was the um, time for the fire trucks or EMTs to come to us on the northern side. And you pointed out by having them have to come down and go over and up, it would be another three or four minutes. I didn't know the roundabouts were going to be slowing them down all the more. So what I'm saying is if you take out Attic Road, which is a more direct route for them to come to us and anybody else on Penn's Drive, um, you're just putting more, you're putting six minutes, which could be disastrous in recovery time. That's your point. Oh, yes, sir. If you, if you go, if you go down Penn's, uh, Penn's Drive all the way down, fur further down, okay, you get near Cranston you know, There are some Amish people that live down there, and they drive little things called buggies, right? Uh, how do we have buggy, the How's the buggy do the roundabout? So they do go to Heimbach, so Heimbach is some traffic, and we see traffic through the dock. It's not a heavy amount, but. I think a roundabout, I think, is going to cause them more problems than anything else you do to And they're not here tonight because they don't come out after so. They use, use the roundabout the same way a vehicle will. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, could you give your name, sir? Uh, Bob Guy Powell, sorry. Great behind um, Mike Haynes, I, um, I read, and maybe it's true or not, uh, that the FAA may have taken issue with how close the construction was to the airport. Did they, and do any of these changes or any of the future changes uh, address that? We have coordinated directly with the Penn Valley Airport uh, in the early parts of the months, and we have uh, satisfied all of those concerns with the uh, proposed alignment of the highway, and also as well with this because of the, that really li that also limited what we could do sure. with the realignment of Mill Road because the runway is little is based is right at this location. Yeah, to speak specifically about the airport, there is some more coordination needed with them on possible temporary impacts to their airspace, like as we have cranes or other yeah, big sure. equipment in the area. But uh, in general, they uh, I guess understand that there's no impact to their airspace with the permanent configuration. Alex Katitis, do you have uh, traffic projections for the next 20 to 30 years for these roads? Mm -hmm. Are they supposed to increase? Yes. We are in uh, The current traffic counts today on Mill Road is approximately 7,000 vehicles a day, and based on the current traffic projections by 2044, it will grow to approximately 10,000 vehicles a day. And that's what these in the roundabouts were designed for. And roundabouts are designed to accommodate up to 22,000. Single lane roundabout can accommodate up to 22,000 vehicles per day. So. Back in the door. Sherry Moore, I live on the Times Drive, not far from here. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I, I apologize standing back here. Why are we moving the roads from the, the intersection we have right now? Absolutely. I'll back up a couple Please. slides. There's two. There was three items that we needed to investigate. One, uh, Airport Road had to be realigned. Why? Because uh, Aqua Water has a, has underground chlorine tanks at this location. Okay, but why can't the road go where it's at now? Right. Aqua Road, just stay where it's at. Where it is. Because the existing main line is right here, and it's going to cross over Airport Road, which was what was previously proposed with the preliminary design. Okay, so we're so airport over. airport road has to be with, with the current uh, with the current design of the CSBT. Yes, yeah, airport road needed to be relocated. Because I just took the long way to work for a really long time to have that new road that they just put in from the crossroads by Pine Box down along the creek and now we're moving it all again. I mean why not just have one intersection with, with a traffic light? I mean, 25 years ago, I used to ride my horses down Mill Road. I won't ride a bike or walk or drive my car on it. But I, I don't understand all this spending to make two intersections. Why not just make one? Because somewhere along the line, you have to go over Mill Road, correct? Yes, in the previous design, it was crossing Mill Road, and we were, and we'll back it up. Here's what was proposed in preliminary design. It was maybe two, three-legged intersections. So in order to go from Ap Road to Mill Road, or to Airport, you would have to come down, make a right, and then turn left to come back down. That was what was proposed in preliminary design, was two intersections on either side of the highway. What we wanted to do was give, is, uh, see if we could improve the skew angle between Mill Road and the structures, because right now it was at a severe skew, which in, which in turn requires longer span and a bigger structure. Across the road. Across the road. By reducing it to a 90 degree, we could accommodate that with a single span structure, where previously we were looking at either a two span or a three span. Now we're down to a single span structure, that means no piers, you just have two sides of the bridge. And it's a smaller construction cost versus what was shown in preliminary design. So adding all these other pieces is less expensive than having one big piece. Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. And, I and the operations of an intersection the, with uh, vehicle travel time and delay by introducing a traffic signal, the, the actual operations on this roadway would actually function worse when you introduce a traffic signal, because the benefit of a roundabout is its continuous movement. 
Well, I don't like them, but to further my thing with Penn's Drive, mm -hmm. don't do anything that changes the traffic flow. Because I live on that road, mm -hmm. 25 years, 29 accidents in front of my house, people trying to go that way. Thank God no fatalities, and I'm not kidding you, that's the absolute truth. Hi, this is Sherry. I've had an accident, they don't even have to ask where I live anymore. So you start changing up Attic Road, and all that little twist and turning at the other end of Penn's Drive, good lord. I yeah, could have 30 a, a year. Okay. We'll have two more questions two on more this area. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, Christine Kulajan, what is the savings amount by doing this? Uh, one million. One million. Rough. One million. Rough. There's <laughs> one million, and we're reducing the required right away by 50%. <laughs> okay. So then it's only a really flush like a penny. nine million cost if you impact this here. But we're also using this as an opportunity to plan for the future. And with this intersection operation, we can, it will accommodate future growth up. Right now we're projecting to 2044 and beyond with the traffic volumes that we're projecting. Yeah. But that, wouldn't that go down if you left the other roads open? Attic Road, Ranger Road? Yes, and this was designed based on the idea that whether you leave Attic Road or close it, it will accommodate that additional traffic volume. Yeah, but that road won't. No. Mm -hmm. App Road has no burn. No. Yeah. You can't put one on. You're going to close one road and overload the next one. Mm -hmm. They're going back to the attic rooms. Oh, we're going back to that. Okay. Okay. Any any other any comments more, on more? the roundabout? Albert Heimbo. Uh, how much land does it take to put that roundabout? The diameter of a round, this diameter is 130 foot. So. I don't know that we can give you an exact, I don't, I don't have those exact figures, but versus, just to give you an idea of what, how, how much it was, re as you can see here, this, all this area and beyond was what was the, the initial right away would be out. And the roundabout brought this down here, so all the, just trying to, try to give you some kind of scale, Airport Road originally swept out, so all this land was no longer necessary for right away. So we, we really we reduced it close to 50% with this, with this, with this new design. And that'll so. be plot of grass maintenance? Yeah, it's just going to, yeah, it's whatever's currently utilized now is what it, what it will. There's no circles around. There's no circles around. Excuse me? There's no circles around about now. So what does that mean? Is usually, we don't have it. I was referencing to the uh, previous design. So, all right, with that, we're going to move on to the uh, next section. I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. The last area we're looking at here with our uh, design refinements is the uh, Saloni Wafers area. So what we have on screen is the design as it was at the end of the preliminary design. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we have here, we have Park Road at the top of the screen. Uh, we're sitting down here somewhere in the township building. Over here to the right side of the screen, we have Colonial Acres and we have Fisher Road. Whoops. Fisher Road going across the bottom of the screen. Um, our original design started out with a bridge over Park Road, bridge over Fisher Road. Colonial Drive being realigned to form a T intersection with Park Road. So why do we look at this area? Um, we had some concerns with constructability, and we also wanted to try and optimize the designs. So the constructability concern was all with this embankment between the two bridges. Basically, we were building an embankment cone between the two bridges. So, construction of that would have been very difficult. We would have actually been, um, it would have been a greater impact for the ramps and hall roads than what was actually needed by um, what you'll see is when we take that bridge out, it improved the uh, constructability. So what changes did we make? We eliminated the bridge over Fisher Road, 
we realign Fisher Road from the north. We're going to tee it over and create a tee intersection with Park Road. We terminated to Fisher Road coming from the southern or from the south with a cul-de-sac up against CSVT. We realigned Colonial Drive and we placed the stream along Fisher Road in a culvert. So just looking at what we've done here on the plan, first we eliminated the bridge or bridges. We realigned Fisher Road. We put a cul-de-sac over here on Fisher Road coming from the south and we realigned Colonial Drive and lastly we to address the stream running next to Fisher Road, we uh, inserted the uh, culvert. So what benefits do we have? First, we eliminated the constructability issue by eliminating the one bridge. We also eliminated <coughs> approximate, or we save approximately five million in construction and future maintenance costs by eliminating the one bridge. What impacts are there? Well, now we have the cul-de-sac on Fisher Road, and we have additional wetland and stream impacts. So that finishes off our changes at Colonial Acres. I'm Beth Goldman, representing Elizabeth Garamedi on 253 Fisher Road, where the cul-de-sac is. I'd like to publicly state that I feel that you are taking advantage of my mother, who is 86, who has Parkinson's. It is her only asset. You have not claimed the property in whole. You said you're going to rent the property and run the construction equipment across it and pay us a rent, rental fee to use the land, but not take it. I want to publicly say that, and we've said this all along, I don't understand how you can destroy and devalue a piece of property and not take it in eminent domain. That being said, if the property is not purchased by PennDOT, what safety issues are you putting in place in the cul-de-sac in terms of lighting for the, some whoever is living in that neighborhood because you're dead-ending the road and now there's not flowing traffic? Are you going to put street lights there? Who's maintaining it? Um, you've already said there's going to be a fence along the embankment. The embankment, my understanding is, is going to be 10 stories above my mother's home. Not, you say 100 feet, I say 10 stories, just so you get a good impact. What lighting or what safety things are you going to do in the cold stuff? Are you putting additional street lights in? Who's maintaining it? Is the township maintaining it? We've not progressed that far yet with the lighting, but at this time I don't believe it's anticipated for any lighting on the call to yeah, Ultimately, because Fisher Road is a township road, uh, it would continue to be owned and, and maintained by Monroe Township. Uh, and no additional lighting will be put in because it's being dead-ended? We, we'd we work with the township officials, but... And is that on the township to, to maintain that once it's been installed? Is that their cost, your cost, who pays for it? Well, I guess all of those are, are the types of details that uh, we need to consider yet during final design. No, so there's going to be a fence along the embankment. It's going to be 10 stories high. 10 stories above my mother's house. 10 stories. Who is maintaining the embankment? Since it's so steep, it won't be able to be maintained by the homeowner. There will be a fence. Who's collecting the garbage? Who's containing all of the animals, the rats that will be there while people throw garbage off, their, off the highway into the embankment? Who's going to clean it? It would be maintained uh, the same way the rest of the highway right away along the corridor. So that means it's going to be maintained because it's so steep you can't, you can't get up the grade, correct? Because you made it so steep to not impact my mother's property so you don't have to buy it. So no, it's I, a steep impact, so nobody's going to maintain it? It hasn't been steepened. Uh, you know, it would, the standard uh, highway embankment score. And what is that? And what is that? Uh, two to one. Two to one what? Two, two, uh, for every two feet horizontally, it would go up one foot per okay. And what does constructability mean? You said in the construct it helps in the constructability. What does that mean? Well, access to the site. In order to construct a big cone in the middle, for the yep. go back there, please. That one? Yeah, that's one. In order to construct that big cone of material where the two bridges would connect, yep. we have to actually get material in there to do that. Right from my just to chart. get in, just to get the material in there to construct it would be a much bigger impact than the area around that cone. Is what Brian was trying to explain. So, 
by doing by the proposals that we're making, um, there'll be much less temporary impact um, than what would be if we had kept with the original plan to build that road. And the bridge over Park Road, are you driving the pylons into the ground? So is it going to be like the project in Danville with the cut and cover where I live, where you drove the pylons into the ground and the house is shut? Is that what you're doing? Again, those details aren't finalized yet. Okay. Final, final How are you getting the, the pylons, right? We don't know. We don't know. That. Okay. When, that's part of final design? Correct. Okay. So no one's maintaining this, the incline. You're renting my mother's property. And as of today, because you don't have right of way completed, you're not taking an 86-year-old woman's property who, when you they moved here in 1976. We've been reentering this constantly. There's other people that have Okay, well, I just want to make that. sure that it's to understand. Yeah, there's a lot of details left to be worked out. Right. Five minutes, so. Bob Dow, Colonial Acres, Homeowners Association. I think I have to get back to the question. I went to a meeting here with the supervisors. PennDOT told us at that meeting that they were not going to close any roads in the construction of any of our local roads in the construction of this. Here we are, apparently, that you folks are going to do what you want to do at the end of the day. It's, it's not great what they've done. I've been to all these meetings since they started this road. We were told different things. They, they moved the projection of the road down on our road. Now they want to close all these roads, make it inconvenient for all the citizens. And I think I speak for everybody that's at this meeting tonight and others that aren't here. You ought to put the road in the way it was designed and leave our roads, our little roads, alone. We'll have better access for emergency vehicles. Better access for emergency vehicles of all types to get to our homes. We want our roads the way they are. We're the taxpayers, and that's what I'm telling you if we want. And that's right, it was approved and paid for under the current roadways. It's already been approved, and now you want to change everything, and we don't like it. Tim Wolf, too bad I have about four or five pages of questions to ask you people, and I won't ask them all. But I'd like to see everybody in this room that, and even outside this room, that's in favor of closing these roads, in favor of, raise your hand. Does that answer your question? <laughs> now, gentlemen, 18, 20 years ago, I started with this project. I know what it's about. If you think sound mitigation is going to happen to you little people out here, forget it. They told us that before, and I'm going to tell you that's what's going to happen now. They're going to give you lip service. The last thing I'm going to say is I'm going to encourage the township supervisors to get special counsel like we had before, like... Kenneth Joel, and if you have to, take him to court and sue him. I hated to say that, but I'm listening to you right now, and you're not giving us the answers. I look at your website, there's nothing on there. The other thing I'm going to ask you, and it's not up here tonight, is Portland Drive and Smoking Dam. That is a non-existing road right now. There's no road there. Not all. There's no travel from north to south. You're going to put that road in, how much is that going to cost? You can say anything about that. you have an answer? Yeah, that's a component of the design we're still working through with Shemokin Dam Borough. Um, you know, that's I, a done deal. It, that specific road was a mitigation commitment uh, to build that as part of the project. Uh, it was identified through the environmental impact statement process. Uh, the local roads that we've talked about tonight in Monroe Township. You know, again, I'll reiterate that we understand they would be changes to the, the preliminary engineering for the project. Uh, specifically for the Attic Road and uh, Granger's Road bridges, we wanted to get input. We didn't think we were doing our due diligence if we didn't at least ask the question if it was possible to eliminate those bridges. Uh, in this case at Colonial Acres, it's a little bit of a different story that there is a, a need to adjust the, the preliminary engineering uh, to make the project constructible. Uh, in this case, we are still accommodating through movements by connecting Fisher Road over to Park Road. Uh, you know, so we don't, don't see this as quite the same situation as Attic Road or Granger's Road. What is the cost for Portland Drive? You have an estimated cost. What is it? We don't have that number with us. You don't have it with, with you. I don't understand that. <laughs> 
you have all these other cost savings, but you're going to build a road specifically that isn't there now for Shamoka Dam. No wonder why Joe McGranahan is so happy. That's just road. It's a bridge. Huh? It's a bridge you can go off and over the 61 bypass. That's just the road. I understand. No, there's a separate road that can go there. There's a the road, road, but there's also the bridge coming across there, too. It goes right up to that glide. I'm very familiar with that. I've been here for 40 some years. Okay, okay, let's move right, on. Yeah. Wait, I have a question. Did you not just say, I just want to make sure I understand. Did you not just say that these changes have to be made to make it constructible? Is that not what you just said? Yeah, no, this particular one here okay, is okay. So why is it that the original design was approved and all of us here, we've been going through this for 20 years, right. all of us here have been to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, walked, walked our neighborhoods and all of that, and the plan was approved, but now you're saying to make it constructible. I thought it was constructible. Isn't that the plan that we approved? Now you're saying it's not constructible. And in the beginning of this meeting, you said this is preliminary. So basically, it's going to change again, correct? No, what we said well, no, that's what you did say. <laughs> that is what you said. I said the concept shouldn't change. I said there are a significant number of details yet to be worked out related to drainage. So it's going to change. Stormwater design. Those finer details may change. May. Uh, these concepts are what we've developed now that we've finally gotten into final design for the project. You know, that I thought was we the, had a final design yeah. years and years and years ago that we all agreed on. And now you're the, saying, but we're going to change it. That was we the, have made life-changing decisions, people in this room. Right. Yeah. We've yeah. purchased yeah. properties. Yeah. People have lost their homes. Um, people are inconvenienced. We've made our decisions based on what you told us was going to happen. Now you're backstepping ste and saying, well, it's not going to happen this way. Now we're going to close your roads. We're going to reconstruct so that it's constructible. You said it was constructible before. I... I I'm an intelligent person. I'm not getting this. It's called bait and switch. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's called. Well, I'm not accusing you of Yeah, that's. I would request that, as you know, as you're doing more analysis on this, that you guys do take into account. That's bridge work. On existing like, bridges. Neighbor, so these are new bridges. So I bought a house on Red Legend. Based on what right I was told. Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. you know, I, this I hatch, that that that's existing road removal. Mm -hmm. And that would go back to and my neighbors and I can absorb the right. so 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 to so our biggest asset. That we've been in the park. And then Kalani will be here. Say last one. Thank you. Steve Rowe. Down uh, some safety questions about this refined design. So can, can you tell me how close those two T intersections are going to be? Colonial Drive and Fisher Road. Out. Without knowing what the grade of the road is in and out. Without knowing what the grade of the road is, I'm not sure how they would care. Whether that's whether they're just I'm not sure. Without knowing what the grade of the road is in and out. Without knowing what the grade of the road is in and out. Without knowing what the grade of the road is in and out. A, a little bit. A little bit from the right. Spanish comments, the intersections tend to be difficult and dangerous. So if I'm coming down Fisher Road, I'm looking to my left around the corner under the underpass to determine if it's safe to pull out there and make a left turn. Let's add two roundabouts. Can I? I <laughs> no, I, but I question the safety there because I know what the intersection of the road looks like. There's enough information on that slide to, to do that, isn't it? Site distance has been looked at. Site distance has been looked at. And the conclusion was? It was sensible. <laughs> Last question. Now it's my turn. <coughs> We're going to talk about safety. Uh, being a deputy fire chief for Hummel's Wharf and the Township Emergency Management Coordinator, I am very concerned about the safety problems that are being presented here tonight. Uh, could you put the slide up with the Granger Road?
Okay, on the right hand side you have County Line Road. Is that the one that's going to be closed for several years? Yeah, during construction of the northern section of the project there is a multi-year period where that will be covered. I think I was told I think I was told it was five or six years. My concern is that's our best access to get to the upper part of the township with fire apparatus. Uh, you, the size of apparatus today, you prefer to stay on the safer roads rather than go on the side roads. Uh, then you're going to take off uh, Granger Road, so I can't use that. The next road is uh, Sunbury Road, and that's <laughs> miserable. <laughs> the next road's 11th Avenue, and so you take a fire truck of our size up 11th Avenue, oh my God. and then all the way out Park Road, to get out where you need to be, there is a time differential, quite a bit. And that's in good weather. In bad weather, it's a lot more. Uh, what you need to understand with time is whenever there's a fire, fire expands exponentially. It just doesn't double. It doubles the first time, then it's quadrupled the next time. All that's with time. Well, if you're in a fire for even one or two minutes, that means an awful lot. And I know you've been throwing time around here tonight. Oh, it's only going to be two or three minutes, maybe four minutes here. That's a big deal with public safety. Absolutely. And what I want to know is what plans you have to mitigate those problems. You could use pen well, again, again, we wanted, you know, we're not familiar with your specific response routes and where uh, responders are coming from, so that's where we wanted your input. The other question I have is when you put those two roundabouts in on Mill Road, what are you going to do with Mill Road in the meantime? Hmm. During construction, During construction. <laughs> 230 foot <laughs> circles. What are you going to do with Mill Road? We're still looking into traffic control. <laughs> 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 Thank you, I've said enough. No, we need to address that. We didn't think of that. Cut across the airport. We're going to use Attic Road. Get a place. Yeah, first stage of construction. <laughs> this Mill Road would remain, remain open because it's completely off line. So these two legs as stage one. Stage two is building this additional ramp. And therefore, for stage three, this will be opened up and operational while we construct the final roundabout. Just this, yeah, at, at, at this time, the only thing that we need to do to construct this final roundabout is we need to utilize Attic Road as a detour. Well, you close it. Excuse me. No, 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 I'm saying this, but when we're, uh, this is stage three. This will be open up and operational, so you can still have a more sound movement as you go down through. And to get up and around, you have to use Attic Road. So it's, uh, you only need a detour for the three to four months of construction to build the final roundabout. So for the first two stages, it's just built completely offline, and that's this intersection of tornado. So it's only a need for, the expected need for will be in place for between three to four months to build a final roundabout, and it'll be a cut off for vehicles. So again, my concern is the same. How do I get up there? I have to take all side streets now. You don't have to take all side streets because, as I, if, as I said, stage one to stage two, this intersection, all four legs remain open. I understand that. When you make that second, when you make that second roundabout, yes, that's three or four months. Yes. How do I get up in there? And it may not be three or four months. Maybe three or four weeks. Those are all kinds of. <laughs> 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 I'm dead serious. I just want to get away. I'm serious. One construction is so stupid. Do you think we are? But to get in there, you'll have the north south movement because this will be constructed. To go all the way down and get out Penn's Drive and up Attic Road? Yep. Forget it, the house burned down. Yep. Yep. And what, what are you going to do if you close down your road? 
And you know, there's also, if you, have, if you have been involved, there's also provisions during construction to allow emergency vehicles through a construction site. If that is a chief concern, if it's accessibility, you can work with the contractor for an emergency vehicle. So that's, there, that's an additional well, concern, right? Why should I have to work with the contractor? Right. That should be set up in the planning. And, and as we finalize traffic control plans and anticipated schedules, we'll work further with local emergency services. And that is facilitated through once it's let to bid and the contractor is selected, those pre-construction those pre -construction meetings are held with emergency services vehicles to lay out the coordination plan to address those concerns with emergency services. If, if you uh, close out roads, then what's the deal going to be? When you make the With the station, out. yeah, order, before they move, before that can be done, added road must remain open for the construction of the structure. So that would be another wrinkle. That that's that's another wrinkle that we have to consider during the construction process. Those are all those are all the design elements that we have to consider. But in order for this to be constructed, added road must remain open. Yeah, they're within the core. Yeah, they're within the core. But I'm getting that's getting too far to the needs for details. I know there's any other questions that are coming from the design. But if you want to come talk to me on the side, I'm happy to help you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Design changes. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I just got to say one thing. I thank you all for coming tonight. But you asked the people what they Bob Guy Pell, by the way. Okay? Uh, you asked the people what they thought about it. Somebody asked us to raise our hands if we liked what we saw. And I just hope you go back with there's 100 people here tonight, all right, for a meeting that if you go on your website, it was supposed to be held last year. On the on, uh, last year is when the website had listed on it for a preliminary meeting, okay, not tonight, but last year in the middle school when they, they didn't change the website. And you're asking us for input. We gave it to you. We don't want it. It was passed, the bill was passed, the money was appropriated, and that's what we want. And what you're talking about is you're saving peanuts here. Absolute peanuts here. Attic growth, 3.2 million out of 670 million. It's peanuts. Yes, and so what? It's less than 2% you're yeah. talking about saving. That's right, yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The question is if you save 10 million, does the project come in at 660 million? No. Absolutely not. You're going to spend the full 670 anyway. Uh -huh. So you're not saving anything, you're just reappropriating uh -huh. other expenses. So the roundabout. Or, or possibly to 10 structurally deficient bridges somewhere else in the state. I doubt it. I doubt it. I'd like to see that. Yeah, we'll me too. Okay, I, I know there's a, a group of hands up yet. I think we should break up and take individual questions at this point. Uh, I guess just to talk about next steps, uh, you know, the, the meeting that we had a year ago that's referenced on the website was to, to kick off final design. Uh, like I said, that's it was about a year ago that we started final design. And like I said earlier, we have about three years to go yet of final design until we actually get to construction. So uh, our plan moving forward is that we're going to continue to talk about ironing out some of the details or continue to iron out some of the details that we've talked about tonight. Uh, we'll start to lay out preliminary right-of-way lines to, to define impacts to private property. Uh, we anticipate that Early in the fall, we'll have a, a full public meeting, not just to cover uh, the Monroe Township portion of the project, but to cover uh, Shemokin Dam Borough also. Uh, so there'll be an open public meeting early in the fall where you can get uh, even further updates on the design at that point. So if the township supervisors don't have anything else, we could break up and take individual questions to the design team. I might want to think about a bigger venue. <laughs> 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 <laughs>